All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Band with Kaleidoscope Ears. And uh, hi, James. Good to hi. see you. Hi, Vinny. Happy Global Beatles Day, almost. Almost, yes. It, Global Beatles Day was yesterday, and uh, that is to commemorate the satellite broad, the very first worldwide satellite broadcast, and uh, countries throughout the world contributed, and Britain, and all their wisdom at that particular time, and it, I'm not being cynical, it was wise, they broadcast the Beatles, and, and the Beatles thought it was a great idea to spread the message of love around the world. And so they sang. All you need is love. Oh, right. Baby. I thought it was your mother should know. Right. <laughs> that was apparently Paul's. Paul was apparently working on that. And he thought maybe we should do this song, guys. Oh. <laughs> but John no, came up no, with no. all you need is love. And the yeah. rest is history. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good work, John. Good work. <laughs> you saved us. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the way George put it with that song. He said, it's a little bit of PR for God. <laughs> oh, all is you need is love. Not your mother should know. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not your mother should know. <laughs> all right, now that we've lost the non-Beatles fans, yay. All right. Yay. Now we have the real troopers. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about a hard day's night, obviously enough, and... Uh, well, let's get a little bit of, you know, what was going on around that time and what the Beatles were thinking. Sure. All right. So I I'm sure everybody, everybody must know at least a little bit of this story. But of course, the Beatles were working on their next film. They needed the they needed a number to open it, a number one hit, a title track. And the title, of course, famously comes from a Ringo Malapropism. Uh, quote, Ringo Starr, we went to do a job and we'd worked all day and we happened to work all night. I came up still thinking it was day, I suppose. And I said, it's been a hard day. And I looked around and saw it was dark. So I said, night. So we came to a hard day's night. <laughs> so apparently, I, apparently John and Paul tell different versions of this story. But mm. John's version, I was going home in the car and Dick Lester suggested the title Hard Day's Night from something Ringo had said. Uh, I had used it in his... In, in his own right, his book, but it was an off-the-cuff remark by Ringo. You know, one of those malapropisms. A Ringoism, where he said it just not to be funny, he just said it. So Dick Lester said, we're going to use that title, and the next morning I brought, brought in the song, because there was a little competition between Paul and I as to who got the A-side, who got the hit singles. And so, anyway, Paul remembers that story slightly differently, but the essentials are there. John went away and wrote the meat of the, the song, but... Here's the one thing that I found when just digging, doing some cursory digging around about this song. Um, why, why did Paul sing the middle, the middle part of the song? And according to CheatSheet.com, uh, while working out the various sections of A Hard Day's Night in the studio, John and Paul put together a middle part that served as a solid contrast to the verses and chorus. The thing was, John wasn't able to sing it. Uh, the only reason Paul sang on Hard Day's Night was because I couldn't reach the notes, John said in All We Are Saying. Uh, singing, when I'm home, everything seems to be right when I'm home, uh, which is what we do sometimes. One of us couldn't reach a note, he'd get the other to do it. When you watch the Beatles play this track live, you can see John and Paul's competitive natures come alive. Each time he gets the middle part, Paul really milks the feeling you're holding me uh. tight, tight, yeah. <laughs> Girls shriek invariably following this moment in the song. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there you go, a bit of John Paul rivalry, yeah. but... But a healthy rivalry, and uh, I think most people conclude this was probably John's crowning achievement album, because this was heavily a John album, and maybe yeah, the last yeah. one that was definitively a John album. Yeah, I think we're closely coming, we're broaching to like an equality between the two songwriters, historically, you know, um, but we're, I think we're beginning to get a glimpse of that on this record. Just a slight glimpse. I, it is predominantly John. Uh, Paul has some good songs on here, too, for sure. He has some good songs, as always. So, yeah. Um, thanks for that, James. Any other uh, stuff I, I there? think that's it. As I say, everyone knows a bit Everybody of this Everybody knows, story. yeah, yeah. And if you haven't watched the movie watch the movie what are you doing it's it's an actually good movie genuinely good movie it's genuinely good movie i i have it on my computer i even have their bad movies on my computer <laughs> magical yeah. mystery tour and... yeah <laughs> i've never seen magical mystery tour i'll have to admit i will have to watch it before we get to that era i guess but i don't know if i was ever able to get through the whole thing it, it's like <laughs> 
I've it's heard just it's so, not their crowning achievement. <laughs> no, I mean, that was so 60s. They were just kind of meandering, you know. It'll be cool. Yeah, right. That's what happens when you take acid and get movie ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so as we go into the song, you know, the Beatles had this ability to create these iconic introductions to songs. This one is no exception. This, this is like the chord that was heard around the world in a way, you know. And of course, we are talking about the infamous introductory chord to the song. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of internet chatter and arguments and all this about this opening chord. And uh, it's kind of fun to see what people come up with. So uh, to give you, a, I'm going to give you a screenshot right now of what I picked up on, on the Beatles Bible, a list of how people dealt with this chord. So let me pop that up for you. All right. So we have a dominant ninth of F in the key of C. I don't know what that even means. <laughs> <laughs> uh GCF. I don't know where I've seen these two B flats in here. I don't know these next two lines where they get a B flat. There is no B flat in there. A polytriad uh, minor seven over five in A flat major. Huh? What? What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, now we're getting closer to reality. G7 sus4 and D7 sus4. They make some kind of sense, both of those. G7 with added ninth and suspended fourth is the right answer, but that's not the way you name the chord. Um, the next close, uh, well, super and blah, 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 blah. G sus4, D, not quite. G11 sus4, uh, n n that's kind of redundant. The mm, sus4 right. and the 11 are yeah. the same. And right. me and Matt, my buddy Matt, had a discussion about the name of that chord. Uh, just yesterday, because I think, I believe that in jazz circles, when you build up a chord up to the 11th, the the thing to do is eliminate the third from the chord. So, so to say G11, 11 is a sus4. So to say G11 mm. sus4 doesn't make sense. It's right. just redundant. Yeah. any case, skipping, cutting to the chase, G9 sus4 is the proper answer. Over D, it's basically just saying that D is the bass note there. Uh, but really, uh, you know, there's plenty of chords on guitar where you have the fifth on the bass. That, that D is the fifth of the chord. It's, you know, just a common thing. So I just call it G9 sus4, and I will be explaining that in a little bit. All right, so... Um, all right, I guess it's time. I ran into an article by, <laughs> yeah, by pure serendipity, actually. I was, all, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to do the podcast on Monday and Hard Day's Night, great. And by pure coincidence, my producer, George Monaraj, sent me this article by a guy named Paul Ostrander analyzing this chord. And... Um, this is a great example of a li having a little knowledge can be dangerous because this guy just goes down the most bizarre rabbit holes that don't have anything to do with anything at, at points. Uh, it's really funny. You know, I, I said to George, I, I wrote back to him and this long rant of an email saying this, 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 and this, and this. And uh, I said, look, I'll tell you what, if you want to get music theory, go to a jazz piano player or me. You know, <laughs> actually, a jazz guitarist would, would have all this, you know, uh, but rock guitar theory is just so naive. It, it, it really, you know, they really guitarists don't know theory very well, like notoriously. Um, so what we're going to do is go down this the rabbit hole of this article. James, I'd like you to maybe if you could do me a favor and read read uh, through it and I'll stop you at certain points. OK. Because I, I want to comment. All right. Well, uh, how about the opening line? This is a divisive subject, apparently. Yeah, it's a divisive subject. And I'd like to point out, as as we go along this article, this guy is making it even more divisive. Because <laughs> when I read it, I was really pissed off. <laughs> so, 
Okay, yeah. well, then he goes on to say he's going to stay away from that and provide you with two possibilities, blah, blah, blah. The notes are as follows, played by various members of the band. F, G, C, D, F, D, G, A. And he says, if you remove the redundancies, it's F, G, C, D, A. All right, so this is his ordering of the notes. I call it improper ordering. Now, music... Doing something like this is like solving an anagram, okay? What we're going for is the possibility of how these these notes can be built in thirds. Now, the song is in the key of G, so we're going to assume a G root to begin with, okay? So the properly ordered notes, G, C, D, F, A. Now, now this would be a G9 chord, except... If you look below, a G9 chord is right here, an official G9. The difference between the two chords is B and C, right? So this is called a suspended fourth. This is this chord that he misordered the notes on is a G9 sus4. That's what the chord is, okay? Now, uh, go on, I think he goes on a little, f what was the next little point there? It's a there? really unique chord structure, because it has essentially two dominant sevenths, uh, a fifth apart, on top of each other, G7 and D7. All right, G7 is GBDF, so ding, ding, ding on that. Well, and, except and for the B. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, well, G7, GBDF is but, a g7 right but the notes here are c g c d oh right right well yeah actually yeah he's not considering that this is a suspension so he doesn't know anything about that right <laughs> so hmm. yeah yeah so uh, the d the d7 would be d f sharp a c so you have a few notes from that but f sharp no no <laughs> no, we're the, no no this is neither a g7 nor a d7 <laughs> Right. I don't know where he got that, you know. And then he throws the word polychord around like he's deep. I, you know, like, sorry, man. This is so, such a, I don't know. I, I don't know where he's getting. I'd like to sit down with him one day and say, hey, where'd you get these ideas? Because I just don't get it. All right. Yeah. All right. So anyway, moving yeah. on. Yada, yada, yada. And then he goes on to say, since the song is in the key of G major, Having a G7 resolved to G major is just clunky and wouldn't sound right. All right. He's, that is true. That G7 doesn't resolve to G major. There's no action there. It just goes there, right? That doesn't sound like a resolution. But he's missing the point because this chord is a suspended chord. And what do suspensions cry out for? Resolution. So in other words, if I just do a, a G7 with a suspension, I, I'll just do a G with a suspended fourth. And I, I resolve the suspension, right? So because this nine chord is suspended, it resolves, all right? So he's wrong about that. It's the same chord, but it has a suspension built into it, so it needs to resolve. Okay? So the chord, that's the closest I could come on a guitar without all the other instruments. Okay. All right, uh, moving on, James. Anything else? Uh, well, I mean, there's a lot else, but, I mean, eventually... I mean, where do you want to go? He, dominant seven chords want to move their seventh down to the third of the tonic chord. In the case, it's G major. In this case, it's G major. All notes in a harmony want to move stepwise as a default. Yada, yada, yada. And then he eventually gets to F9, add 13. This one, I think, makes the most sense in context. F is not in the key of G major, blah, blah, blah. So F9, add 13 is the conclusion that he comes to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, F9, F... F9, add 13, that would be this. Or, uh, it doesn't sound like the chord, you know. Like I said, this is the closest you could come. Okay? Now, uh, 
I think the word was that John is playing this. Uh, George is... Wait, wasn't John playing a D? Oh, John sus. was playing the D sus. George was playing this. Yeah. In fact, in that interview, he actually said, that's what I'm playing. Uh, but then there's more, because Paul is playing a D in the bass, which is inconsequential. It's just the fifth of the chord. Um, so and should we George listen to this chord being constructed? Because we can listen Why to it. Why don't we listen to it? Let's, okay, let's so listen. this is yeah. Randy Bachman of the Guess Who, a Canadian, just for the record. Yep. Um, who apparently, anyway, worked it out, and this is a clip of him showing an audience one night exactly how it is constructed. Because when you hear it all at once, it's like, bang, it's like the greatest thing to hear all at once. I heard the first chord. It was George on a 12 string, just like this, and it's an F chord. But you put a G on top. And you put a G on the bottom. And you put a C next to that G. Now, I said, and put on Paul's bass. What, what note was Paul playing? Paul's playing a D on the bass. And John's rhythm guitar was a D chord with a sus4, which means it got a G note on it. So now listen to this. We only did this yesterday, and it just blew me away. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Fantastic! Woo! Here we go. One, two, three, four. It's been a hot day's night. Sing along. You know, it's funny, James. Remember how you commented how John songs tend to have no intros and will just start mm, singing? Yeah. If it wasn't for that yeah. chord, and that was George Martin's idea, or, or Richard Lester, I forget who, but, you know, they needed, like, something punchy mm. because it's a movie. Yeah, and uh, so otherwise, oh, John would have just kicked in and said, "It's been a uh, yeah, you know, right, exactly, yeah." But can you so can you imagine why or how they came up with that? Does that, that make any you, sense oh, like to you? Like, yeah, would through. you have sat down and said, "Okay, here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to play." Like, why? That's an interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, well, I. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if you look at the chording John does for the song, we have the pinky on the Gino, and he goes, and then that is connected to the intro chord. Right. Probably they discussed we need a big ass chord. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and John might have said, hey, you know, this this is really cool, this F with the G on it, and then probably from there they were just messing around and. I, I wouldn't doubt that Martin might have said, hey, George, play a D with a sus4, you know. Uh, or no, John. I'm sorry. Uh, John, yeah. play a D with a sus4 and, and, you know, whatever. Paul, play the D bass. Like, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's a weird combination, but hey, it works. <laughs> and of course, uh, George Martin was on the keyboard, so he contributed another D sus4. So, uh, yeah, it's remarkable to hear that because it really is a clone of the actual record. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. It, it sounds like it man and again you know it's like so iconic it's just so yeah i think of this uh well maybe i'll get into that later but let's so uh, now i, I want to tell you like the chording of the song it's really in terms of the chord movement there's nothing much to write home about g c g f g g c g f g c7 d g c g so it's not a big deal. It's one for messing around with one. Well, it's a mixolydian yeah, chord. I was just going to say, yeah, it's important to point that out, right? Because a lot of people would go, well, where does the F come from? It's right. a board card. It's a mixolydian progression. It's mixolydian. Now, uh, let me explain that real quick. Like, if I'm in the key of C, the three major chords in the key of C, the one, the four, and five, are C, mm -hmm. F, and G. But when you make a root on that G chord, in other words, the, the chord that magnetizes that you want to go... <laughs> to then you're doing one four five but but g well i can't even say one four five you know you have i know to what say, you mean but yeah it's it's in a different order so it's not one it, four five <laughs> it's really one four flat seven major is the reality of it but that aside you know um basically in other words we're We've got three chords, major chords from the key of C, but our, our gravity chord is the G chord. And that makes it uh, where the G chord sits in the C scale is what we call the mixolydian step. And that's what the song is based on. 
And this particular step is so, so important. And we're going to see how this works. One thing I always say to my students when they learn about the modes and then they want to learn about blues, I tell them, look, when you think about the mixolydian mode, think the G7 chord and also think blues because there are two things that could go on on a G7 chord. One is a mixolydian scale. And one is a blues scale. Right? So you can hear the big difference, you know, right? So doesn't sound bluesy at all, but when then, you know, right? So uh, and that's good for a songwriter to know. Because if you're in a mixolydian situation, very often, even if it's pure mixolydian, guitar players will go off on a blues uh, guitar solo with it. Very, very common. So blues and mixo, they're kind of two ends of a continuum. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, I want to talk about the chord forms John uses for this. So he, he uses a G as a high pedal point. And it goes G, C, G, and then F, but with a G in it. Now, it's funny because I always, I have preconceptions about Beatles songs, and then when I go to study them, I find out I was wrong about my preconception, right? When I was a kid, I, I figured this out. And then... And actually, God forgive me for saying this, but I like this better than what John's playing, right? It's got, you know, I, I think so. Anyway, compare, let's say B it. So here's John. This is very nice. Uh, here's Vinny. this particular F chord because it's it's uh, it's paying uh, uh, a nod to the opening chord you know the yeah. right yeah that's just me what do you think you like you like John better, I have course, to right? admit I do prefer the John version because it's more open it's more open yeah more open sound yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way plenty of songwriters have used this kind of thing like a So uh, this, this kind of move is very common. In fact, when I was about 13 years old, I had this guitar, this electric guitar. I don't know. I can't remember like where I got this guitar, but it had these push buttons on it. And one of the buttons would just completely cut the sound off. So I had my drummer friend, like at certain points, like do a repetitive cutting the sound off and bringing it on like that, 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 that. So I had this song I wrote that went like... Uh, uh, I don't know if I could do it. And then yeah. it went. Right. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a little self indulgence there. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I think every guitarist has written some version of GC, D, oh, yeah. GCF. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. All right, so um, talking about chord movement, I all right, so I, I have more to say about melody than I do about chord movement, but uh, let's let's kind of look. So we have G, C, G, F at nine, G, G, C, G. So that's a whole verse, just C, G, C, F. Was there a D in there at one point? I forget. There was um, at one point. At one point. Oh, and again, on the, oh, by the way, what, what Ostrander was talking about was modal interchange, all right? He didn't use the term, but that's the floating term. What's going on? When I put a D chord in it, a D has an F sharp in it. Mm -hmm. F has an F in it. Right. So two different keys. Well, this... 
is just G major, one, uh, four and five of G major. Mm, right. All right, so that's G major is called the Ionian mode, right? And then when you put the F on in it, that's and John did a lot right. of this kind of thing. He liked that sound of, of modal interchange between Mixolydian and Ionian. Um, so there's that. Um, so then it just moves to the bridge, which I love this movement. And I've talked about the three chord at different points. The three chord of the key of G is B minor. And this is where I, I can't help but think that Paul actually wrote this bridge because there's so much clever going on here. The, the first bit of clever is that normally when you're in a, what a typical songwriter will do, this is classic songwriting. If your verses are in a major key, you, you might want to uh, uh, contrast that with minor in, in the chorus or the bridge. Now, as this song stands, there is no chorus. It's, it's got a verse and a bridge. All right, because why? Because the verse starts out with the chorus. It is a chorus in the sense that it's got the hook of the of the song, right? So, yeah. But what I love is that the three chord and typical songwriter might go and go do something like that to get the minor effect. Paul goes to the three chord, the B minor chord, which I, th I really do think it's Paul. Um, so B minor and E minor. And up to G, now we're happy again. So there we have B minor, E minor, B minor, G, E minor, C, D. And then back into It's Been a Hard Day's Night. What I like about that transition is he it's a cool little thing I had never noticed before, but he sings. Then, so he's, you know, the first is like he's going to the seventh step of the scale, which is the, the tension step, you know. You want to resolve, so. really get a sense of it's opening up here and I want to comment about this note too that's Beatles do this a lot that it's not a heavy tension note but on the C note you sing in A and that would amount to a C6 but it sounds almost like the way a suspension res would resolve because now that A is wholly belonging to the chord, you know? So I really love that little juxtaposition there. Now a little more in the melody. <clears throat> All right, so you and I did, what really, the podcast should go down in history. The, the one we did on uh, You Won't See Me. It should go down in history. I agree. You know, let's make it happen. And in fact, in my uh, and I'm going to refer to this because it's all over music. It's all over the Beatles. My video in the Parallel Relative Switch series, the fourth video or the fifth video is about the blues turnaround. And it's so frickin important. It's really, really important. That's why, you know, and interesting. I got if I got a comment on that recently and the guy was like, wow, wow, wow. I never, like, this, like, opened up a whole bunch of doors for me. I was really happy to see that because there's something there. There really is something there. I did a little clip of our podcast in that, uh, in that video. All right, so um, now the melody. We'll get to this blues stuff in a minute. Now, I consider the song to be a kind of sister song to I Feel Fine. Mm. Right? Both 
both songs are in G, right? Both have this, what I call, oh, it's time for a chart, mixolydian pentatonic, okay? And I'm going to screen share. This is some nerdy stuff, so be prepared. <laughs> that's what people, at this point, that's what our audience expects and demands. Get right, to the nerdy right. stuff, come on. All right, so, so here we have a C scale. And the mixolydian section of a C scale would start on G, and this is what our song is doing. It's working off of this scale, where, where G is the root. So I extracted that. Here's your mixolydian scale. We have step one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, one. But it's very close to a major scale. It just has that little flat seven that distinguishes it. In the key of G, this note is F sharp, right? So mixolydian pentatonic, how I got the idea, and I'm sure other musicians have gotten this idea before, but I took the formula for a minor pentatonic, which is one flat three, four, five, flat seven, and I applied it to major, right, to major modes where the three is flexible and the seven is flexible. It might be a flat seven, might be a natural seven, might be a flat three, might be a natural three, right? So the formula again is one, three, four, five, seven. So I extracted the notes from the G mixolydian scale and the one, three, four, five, flat seven is this. And this is what it sounds like. And James, you're real familiar with this because I bring it up a lot. <laughs> Shades of strawberry feels, right? It's it sounds Indian. Right? It sounds Indian. And in fact, this is a, a bona fide Indian raga, by the way. I forget which one it is, but uh, it's like sunrise or something, I forget. Um so the Mixolydian pentatonic includes melody. <laughs> exploited that skill because as you say it sounds it sounds uh indian and uh more movie trivia for folks out there uh the help movie the incidental background music that they use with the indian flavor they do play that melody line but it, with indian instrumentation so it sounds very exotic and indian right which is very interesting yeah, yeah. there's something magical about the way all of this worked honestly like every all the elements just came together the way they were supposed to considering how chaotic it all was yeah. you know yeah. it's it was almost like the chaos was necessary for like god to step in and throw these ideas you know it makes you wonder <laughs> if that's why george resonated so much with the indian sound right because he was already kind of familiar with that yeah. oh yeah i think i i very much think so yeah. I, I very didn't he go out and buy himself a sitar right after that movie I, yep. yeah he was fascinated by it. It's funny. I, I always think George is a reincarnated Hindu. I, you know, he just resonated so much with the culture. There's got to be something there. Like he just wanted, he just wanted to be in India. That's what he wanted. You know? <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, going on with the melody. So we have that, uh, again, pentatonic, uh, mixolydian pentatonic mm -hmm. scale. That's... And I believe, see, I believe that this song and I Feel Fine are the very inklings of the beginning of the psychedelic exploration of sound, because that particular scale was essential to the Beatles' psychedelic sound. But they didn't know what psychedelic was, but they liked the tone of it. And again, remember what I said before about think Mixolydian, think Dominant 7, think Blues, right? Well, this song kind of does that. This is pure Mixolydian. Uh, oh, I got the wrong song. But then... And there's your... Right, little... It, it sounds like blues, that very last note, even though I think he hits it right on pitch, um, but it still sounds like blues. You would think he, he would bend the note, but I don't think he does. I don't think he does, but yeah, I when you play it. But it it almost like it's asking for it in a mm, way, you know? Yeah. 
Hmm. Now, um, so this. The blues turnaround isn't just a turnaround because it belongs to every chord in a blues progression, every major chord or dominant seventh chord, the one, four, and five dominant seven. So in my parallel relative switch theory, the decatonic model allows for, on each chord of uh, the one dominant seven, the four, and five dominant seven, allows for this to happen on each one of the chords. Right? So this is a play on the blues turnaround, which is not just a turnaround. All right, that is purely blues theory. So we have a Mixolydian song, and now we're finding blues elements coming into it. And uh, that's what's uh, incredible about the Beatles. Like, and the fact, well, you know, that's what's incredible actually about the blues turnaround and how uh, there's a million songs out there that embed this into it, and people don't even notice it because it won't sound like blues to them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think, again, uh, you know, our, our look at uh, um, You Won't See Me is an example of that. It doesn't sound bluesy, mm -hmm. but it's got, you know. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Just before we started recording, we were uh, doing a lesson, and I brought up Plush by the Stone Temple Pilots. Yep, yep. Same, yep, yep. same movement. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could remember the name of the song, but Pearl Jam did a version of that. They, they did something like that. Um, I don't know the song very well, but I, I specifically remember that because of that turnaround sound. <clears throat> so uh, now the only thing to look at here, oh, the solo. All right. <clears throat> when, I teach, when I teach, I always tell students, if you want to learn to play lead guitar, Learn this stationary minor pentatonic and the sliding pentatonic. Because so many guitar players of the 60s made an entire career out of those two scales, right? This is no exception because George, and by the way, George is playing blues now, right? Right? Uh, so against these chords, that's definitely blues. Now, I'm going to link you all up to Mike Pacelli's video, guitar lesson video, if you want to learn the guitar parts. He's, he's the king of that. He just does it so well. The way he described the solo is that it goes... And then George jumps up here. And there's a sliding scale. And there it is. Me, I'm lazy. Like, that's why I developed neighborhood playing. Just stay here. It's a little brighter, too. Yeah. Right. Big difference in sound, so yeah. I like it like that. Interesting thing is, George Martin felt the solo was a little thin. You probably know this. Uh, and so he, he told George, you know what? I want to double what you do on piano. But Martin didn't have the chops to play the play it fast enough so the beauty of magnetic tape is when you when you ask it to when there's a there was used to be a little lever that would slow the tape down right to a different speed the beauty of it was it worked out as a perfect octave away so george martin played it like in a low octave you know and then sped it up, and then it fit right in. And it's a cool sound, you know. It's a very cool sound combining, you know, George and and uh, George together, like that. So there's that. There's the George solo. There's nothing right home about it. It's, it's just a sliding pentatonic, sliding pentatonic scale. Um, and finally, the quotes outro. All right, and to me, this is brilliant because it's pointing to our original be beginning chord. What a great way to end a song, too. Like, that is really, really cool. 
I think it fades, right? Yeah. Because that's yeah, when that's... the movie, movie begins. Yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. Like, you know, honestly, when I think about that, like, it makes sense. It makes total sense in the movie. But as a song, it is kind of a weird way to end it. Uh, well, I yeah, I guess so. You know, I never associated with the movie. I just associated from what I heard on the radio. And I always thought, wow, that's... I just thought it was a very unique ending. Yeah. You like, know, I, I, th I can understand why you would write that. Okay, now we're transitioning into the movie. And right, so right, this is right, the part. Right. But, like, I, yeah. as a songwriter, you, I don't think you'd think to... Okay, we're going to fade out with this now. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder who came up with the idea now. You know, George or George or Paul or, you know. Um, I'm almost thinking... Martin might have had a hand in it only to say, look, you know, we're going to be fading into yeah. the film. So we need to fade out with something yeah. rather than just give it a hard ending. Yeah. See, yeah, it's the movie context that probably, yeah, fleshed out because John would not have probably written the intro chord and he probably wouldn't have written that outro if it was yep. just a song. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see if there's anything else in my notes. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, one little comment I want to make, just based on George Martin's impulse. I had this thought today that people say that the Beatles were the first musical act ever t to turn the studio itself into an instrument, right? If that's the case, who's playing the instrument? George Martin, right? So that officially makes George Martin the fifth Beatle. Jeff Emmerich? Well, yeah, I guess so. Like, he came up with some you stuff. Know, yeah, yeah, he sat in the shadow of George Martin. But, you know, Emmerich was the guy that had the crazy ideas, yeah. you know. He had to actually do it, like, actually yeah. find a way to make it work. Uh, but then again, you have to look at when <laughs> when Leonard recorded uh, 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 Strawberry Fields and, you know, one verse, his guitar was tuned differently than the other. And, like, he just flippantly said to Martin, yeah, Martin make said, it work. we can't put these together. <laughs> oh, you'll make it work. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. That is yeah, the craziest part. Well, you know what? It's, actually, it's, it perfectly works. It perfectly it's works. Yeah. That That's one of those things. It is like divine providence. Like, yeah. That divine <laughs> providence, man. I swear. Yeah. Amidst all the chaos, man, something was working behind the scenes to make them what they were which was just pure genius. So, yeah. And by the way, besides uh, Global Beatles Day, uh, Wikipedia says not to be confused with Beatles Day. Mm. Right? Right. Because I think I've Beatles heard of Beatles Day. I have never heard of Global Beatles Day, I'll confess. Yeah. Yep. They get two days out of the year. <laughs> <Beatles> <laughs> Only two? Come on. There should be Beatles <laughs> Week? Beatles Season? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, not for anything, but if we could have Fried Month, we could have Beatles Month, you know. <laughs> At the very least. I'm proud of the Beatles. They should be proud. Why not? There you go. What month would it be, though? Feel free to have your say in the comments, guys. <laughs> yeah, okay. What month would, would be a good Beatles month? Me, I'm betting on December because for me, December is... Uh, December is like that was my time as a kid. Like I was waiting mm. for Christmas and the new yeah. Beatles album yeah, came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had the the Christmas record they always did, right? Yeah. I haven't even listened to all those. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I I didn't even like them when I was young. They they're Beatles goofing around. I imagine uh, you have to have grown up in their English comedy climate to fully exactly. It. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not that they weren't funny. I mean, they were genuinely funny guys, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, James, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's under an hour. Tight 45. We did it. <laughs> and <laughs> and most of that was on one chord. But anyway, <laughs> at least now yeah, people I, know what chord was that. I could tell you were kind of speeding me up. You were pushing me through it, weren't you? <laughs> no, no, no. I, no, I spent all day on the When court. Randy Bachman unveils the chord and the crowd cheers, I get it. It's like, yep, yeah. that's it. That's it. It's amazing. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll put the link to that. I'm going to put a number of links, including uh, Ostrander's article and everything else, into the show notes. But uh, 
the Randy Bachman, um, he had met with Giles Martin and Giles had access to all the tracks. So he was able to separate the tracks and show what each one, each Beatle was doing in that moment, which, wow, that, like, wow. You were just there, James. You visited mm. Abbey oh, Road. Yeah. For, yeah, for people who are interested, yes, I was there. Is that Abbey Road? I've got the pics to prove it. And uh, I also went to Liverpool, Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields. I've been there. Yeah. 24th Lynn Road, sat out, st stood outside. Thinking, and well, 24th on the road is in, I thought that was in Liverpool. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about Liverpool now. Um, we went to Liverpool as well. And so, uh, yeah, saw the sights, took the magical mystery tour on the bus. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. The holy sites, the sacred shrines. Of yeah, the like literally the uh, the church where John and Paul met. We, we didn't yeah. stop that. Well, we stopped there, but we didn't get out. But anyway. Awesome, man. I, I, you have my envy. I just, that's so awesome. And the funny thing is, I, I mentioned to you earlier, but I have to say this. I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Nancy. And if she gives a like to this video, if she doesn't notice that I did that, that means she stopped it somewhere in the middle and walked away. So I'll know. <laughs> right. But my friend Nancy, good friend of mine and a huge Beatles fan, like we were both all about the Beatles. And, uh, Today is her birthday, so happy birthday, Nan. And uh, I texted her this morning, and it turned out, where was she? She sends me a photograph, and there's a picture of her walking across the street at Abbey Road. And I'm like, that can't be Abbey Road. Where are you? I'm in London. I was like, wow, okay, got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so there's like, that's coming, that's happening. A lot of Beatles synchronicities going on right now. Yeah. That's so great. Awesome. Well, the universe is speaking to you, Vinny. Will you listen? Yeah. Yeah, it means I have to write another record and actually live up to my, my dream of making a record that's as good as a Beatles record. Vinny's Abbey Road. Comment, it's coming. Because Nancy's comment to my last record was, Vinny, you're no Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. As true as that might be, that still seems a bit harsh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she did have that side on occasion. So, anyway. All right, so that's it for today. I hope you all enjoyed it. I had a great time. And uh, we'll be seeing you again for the... Oh, by the way, uh, one quick thing is because we always lead in with what the, what's the next single. We'll actually... Uh, I Feel Fine, I don't know what the flip side of I Feel Fine is, but we're actually out of chronological order. I hadn't realized it, but I Feel Fine was in 64 like this was. But I Feel Fine was, I think, November, and this was in April or something. So did we do I Feel Fine? I don't think we did. I don't think so, no. Oh, okay, no. so we'll do that next, right? Maybe we could do that next, yeah. or we, we could look at whatever's on the flip side. We'll of do, it we'll do something from 64. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Then good night, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Yeah, Beatles, Christmas, December, Beatles month, you know. Every day is Beatles Christmas Day. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care. <laughs>